Arvind Ghosh. Uh, these are the six units which we have to complete in first block in one hour and we are late by 15 minutes, right? So come to the first unit, non-fictional prose. Uh, I do not know whether some of you or all of you are from English or not background, but to use a common balance Prose is a section of literature which is neither poetry nor story, rather it is a non-fictional writing. Prose was not known to the Indians till the British people came to India. What we have known so far from our historical and mythological record are all the stories as written in the great books called Tripitaka and some other good books. But all those stories written in Tripitaka and Panchatantra are in the form of story. Most of them are in the form of poems. Prose, we had no idea about it at all. But with the coming of the British, the English literature came and then only our people came to know what prose was actually. So let us start with the beginning of this Indian English prose in India. Arbitrarily, the prose in India began in the year 1794 when a great Indian scholar named Dean Muhammad, D E A N Dean. M-A-H-O-M-E-T, Muhammad. Dean Muhammad was a great scholar who was well versed in English language and who was an Indian. He for the first time wrote some essays and later on he gave a name to the essay and it was called The Travels of Dean Muhammad, which was written in the year 1794. In this collection of essays, there were as many as 38 letters. The whole of the writing was in the form of letter. And in this letter-based essays, Dean Mohammed has described every aspect of India, her relation with her mythology, her history, and the British people above all. After Din Mohammed in 1797, the next important writing was produced by Venkata Boria. Venkata Boria, B O R I A S. Venkata Boria wrote another great book in the year 1809, and its name was given Account of the Gens, J A I N S Gens, Account of the Gens. And this book was basically on Jain, Jainism or the people who followed Jainism in India. But it was a prose. It was a non-fiction or writing. Then came the great man, Raja Ramon Roy, who I think is very well known to you. Raja Ramon Roy was the first Indian to have gone abroad on the sea route. He was the first public figure in India who rose voiced against the Sati right. And he was a great reactionist and defender of Indian culture. Raja Ramon Rai wrote a very profound book in the year 1817. And its name was A Defense of Hindu Theism, T-H-E-I-S-M Theism. A defense of Hindu Thaism. And in this book, he not only defended Hindu religion, he also castigated, he also criticized a number of practices which had then crept into Indian society and debilitated the society, de degenerated the society. So after Raja Ramon Rai, there rose onto the arena a number of great men 
For example, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Vivekanand, Rabindranath Tagore, Sri Aurobindo. These were the eminent personalities who were initially speakers moving across India and across the world. They earned a lot of experiences in life and they delivered their speeches to the people. Later on, all their speeches were compiled into written books. Vivekananda was a great speaker. Ravindranath Tagore was primarily a speaker and secondarily a poet and a writer. Sri Aurobindo was a great thinker first, then he became a writer. And their speeches have been recorded as books. So this was the beginning phase of non-fictional prose in India. And the second point is the condition of non-fictional prose in post-independent India. What was its condition? In post-independent India, non-fictional prose uh, got a great thrival with the endeavor made by great man Sarvapalli Radhakrishna. In post-independence India, Radhakrishnan was the most prominent man who developed Indian philosophy on a very practical level. He popularized Indian philosophy to the West through his books. And he not only popularized Indian philosophy, he told to the West that the Indian philosophy was not something theoretical, it is something practical. It has a great practical value. After Radha Krishna, the next great man was Kuswan Singh, who was a columnist, who wrote for several journals and newspapers. And after Kuswan Singh, there were several literary historians. Mention may be made of K.R. Srinivar Ayangar, Sidi Narasimeya, M.K. Nai, Minakshi Mukherjee. These four persons are literary critics and literary historians. They have written a number of history books on Indian literature as well as Indo Anglian literature. And the third phase is last 50 years of Indian prose. Indian prose has passed through a number of zigzag ways. And so far as the last 50 years are concerned, it has flourished in all its branches. And basically, the Indian prose has flourished on autobiography and biography. A number of biography writers have come onto the scene who have produced a number of books so these are the three phases of Indian prose. Now, what are the typical forms that were developed as prose in India? The common form of development was essay. Whenever you open a book, you will find essays there. And the next important form of development was biography and autobiography. And when we think of Indian playwright, we get a very uh, narrow figure. Only one man who wrote plays in India was Vijay Tendulkar. This man has written as many as 36 plays. Besides this man, there are not any playwrights who have got any recognition. So this is a very short analysis on the background of non-fictional prose in India. This is the first unit. Now come to the second unit of block one. In the second unit, we have three important writers. They are Swami Vivekanand, Sri Aurobindo, and Anand Kumar Swami. Now come to Swami Vivekanand. I do not need to introduce this man because most of you are acquainted with this man, Swami Vivekananda, 
who was born on 12 January 1863 in Kolkata, or rather Kolkata. Swami Vivekananda was a very brilliant chap since his childhood. A very powerful man, powerful. He, he was in the position of a very, very powerful brain. Whatever he was listening and whatever he was experiencing in the practical life was getting recorded in, in his memory unfalteringly. And later on, when he was asked to give out to those experiences, he was telling his experiences without any mystery. He had such a powerful brain. His receptivity was very strong. So when Swami Vivekananda grew up, a problem occurred in his mind. He faced a psychological problem, and that was the problem of uh, disconnection. But he could not establish his connection with the worldly world. He moved around in search of a man who could satisfy his number of queries. And in the way of his searching for a powerful man, he suddenly came across Ramakrishna Paramahansa, the worshipper of Kali Temple at Kalihat. And when he met Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Swami Vivekananda asked him, Sir, have you seen God? And the answer was very startling. Yes, my son, I have seen God as I am able to see you. And in the words of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Vivekananda discovered such a power that he thought, yes, this was the right man who can be followed. And since then, Vivekananda followed every word of Ramakrishna Paramahansa. He went to Kaligat. And at Kaligat, there was a matha, there was a monastery. He remained staying there. He received vast knowledge from Ramakrishna Paramahansa. And Vivekananda made himself a very learned man. And towards the end part of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, when Vivekananda asked him, Sir, how many days shall I, have, shall I have to stay here? Ramakrishna Paramahansa told my son, why are you staying here? What will you do? Go out of this matha, go out of, go out of this monastery and move around the whole of the country. And Vivekananda moved the whole of India and after his traveling all over country, all over the country, he found out several good things and several bad things. And the worst thing about India was its poverty and its dogmatic belief. So with the growing poverty of India and the dogmatic belief, he went outside of India. In the year 1893, Swami Vivekananda was invited to the parliament of religions. There he delivered six powerful speeches. And all those speeches have been recorded as books or essays. Now let us concentrate on the speeches of Swami Vivekananda delivered by him in the Parliament religion in the Parliament of Religions in the year 1893. So his first speech was response to welcome. This was the first speech which has been made into an essay. Response to welcome. This was the title given to the essay. So when Swami Vivekanand went there, he was not immediately recognized by the other religious leaders who had represented from different parts of the nation, part of the globe, they just ignored Vivekanand because of because of his get off. That is sannyasi, wearing saffron dresses, putting a desi cap on his head. Nobody recognized him. But so when this man was asked to deliver his speech at this parliament. He began his historic speech, my dear brothers and sisters of the world. And this, because of this historic expression, the attention of all the 
leaders was kept on him that they were enrapt to listen what Vivekananda was telling. And since then, during all his speeches, the entire audience was wrapped. So next speech, when Vivekananda delivered his next speech and when he went to the stage, all the audience stood up with standing ovation. And in order to mark this standing ovation given to him by the whole of the religious leaders, Swami Vivekananda delivered a powerful speech and its name has been given, Response to Welcome. In this response to welcome, Swami Vivekananda has expressed his thanks to the people of the world, not only on his own behalf, but also on the behalf of whole of India. In this speech, or in this, better to say, in this essay, he has told that India has been desperately waiting for the West to come to India. We want the Western people to come to India, not as invaders, but as friends. We want to know who they are. We want to know what they have. And in turn, we want them to know who we are. We want them to know what we have. So we want a reciprocal connection between the West and the East. This is the summary of his past speech. There is a response to welcome. His second speech that has been turned in, made into an essay is Why We Disagree. The name of his second essay is Why We Disagree. Here, we means all the religions of the world, the Hinduism, the Muslimism, the Christianity, and the Yehudi. That people of different religions have their own ways of thinking, own ways of dress, own ways of fooding. They differ. The people of one religion just cannot put up with the people of another religion. So there is a lifelong dispute among the among different religious sects in the world. And Vivekananda doesn't like this. He says that we, we differ from religion to religion because in our own religion, we have a different course of conduct. In Christianity, there are different course of conduct. And the code of conduct mentioned in Christianity just cannot come in term with the code of conduct uh, described in Hindu religion. So we have to come above all this narrow code of conduct, show the world level humanity, and become brothers to each other. This is the summary of his second essay, that is why we disagree. His third essay is on Hinduism. Name of the essay is Paper on Hinduism. And this was perhaps the largest speech and the largest writing of Vivekananda delivered at the Parliament of Religions in the year 1893. In this largest essay, he has given a very sound picture of Veda, Hinduism and the immortality of Indian civilization. He has described everything tidbit, what Hinduism had been. He never says what Hinduism is. He gave emphasis on what Hinduism had been, what service it had rendered to the people of the rest of the world, and what can derive from this Hinduism. What is not there in the Veda? Veda is not just a collection of books, a collection of four anthologies. Veda is a way of life which can be followed by people of any religion, any caste, any community. His fourth essay is Religion Not the Crying Need of India. This was the name of the essay. Religion, not the crying need of India. And just 
if we put an attention on the title of this essay religion not the crying need of india here we can see that vivekananda is giving a very pragmatic approach to indian religion and he says that india is not crying for any religion in india religion is not a crisis in india what is crisis is knowledge of the west and westernized humanity westernized humanity is they are in profuse in india there is no doubt but westernized humanity cannot make india progressive alone in order to make prosperity india must adopt westernized humanity as well as the westernized knowledge and wisdom so very pragmatic approach to the problem of india his fifth essay is buddhism the fulfillment of hinduism buddhism has not been recognized as a separate religion by vivekananda he says buddhism is not a religion it is just a by product of hinduism it is just a sect 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 in buddhism there are certain principles and those principles are not local based rather they are global based for example the most prominent principle of buddhism is ahimsa non violence and non violence is the only solution to the problem of the world the more you are the violence the more dangerous situation you will bring the world to so everywhere in the world non violence or ahimsa should be followed and ahimsa non violence is the first principle of buddhism the second important principle of buddhism is compassion compassion for every lives may it be a human life may it be a non human life we must have compassion and buddhism sticks to this principle of compassion for lives and vivekananda says to the people of the world follow these two ideologies of buddhism and let the world move by itself the world will move by itself <clears throat> so this is why he said buddhism is the fulfillment of hinduism and the last title of his speech was address at the final session this was the title given address at the final session address means speech that at the parliament of religion of 1893 swami vivekananda gave the parting address final address and this was the address where he spoke to the audience that let us my dear friends construct a platform a world platform where there will be harmony and brotherhood forget your religion forget your geographical barrier forget your sect dress color sex come out of come out above all these things and identify yourself as common human beings and develop your sense of a uh, brotherhood among all the people of the world all just only as human beings not as christians not as muslims or not not as an hindu be common human beings and develop love fraternity and compassion among yourselves and the world will develop by itself and he also in this is invited the western people please come to india if you are not able to come to india then let india come to you and when india comes to you india will not come to you physically india will come to you through her voluminous books like vedas gitas and other books open those books try to discover india and i challenge your civilization will expire 
your generous sons and generous sons of people will expire but you will not be able to discover what india is india is such a big country so this is about the six ss compiled by the followers of vivekananda which they have collected from his speeches at the parliament of religions in the second unit the second point of discussion is sri arabindu you also know about this man sri arabindu was a multi faceted personality swami vivekananda was a monk a philosopher and this much is his identity but so far as the identity of arabindu is concerned he was a politician an educationist a philosopher a yogi a rishi and a great thinker he was also a man of literature and as a man of literature he is still a multifaceted man he was a journalist an editor a literary critic a linguist a translator and at the end a mahakavi a great poet so with this natural or inborn qualities sri arabindo has left his name dazzling in the history of india but we are concerned with arabindo just as a writer but before we know anything about his writings it is better to have a glimpse on his biography the entire life his life of arabindo can be divided into four phases phase 1 england phase 2 baroda phase 3 kolkata phase 3 pondicherry arabindo was the son of a westernized bengali family as he his father was well educated in english language his family had been an updated family so when arabindo was a boy of five only he was born on 15th august 1872 when he was five years old his father took him to england for education so arabindo received his entire academic education i am giving a uh, concentration on the word academic education his academic education had been accomplished in england he got his certificates of academy from england from different colleges of england so he spent several years in england as a student then back home he went to baroda where he spent a long 13 years 1 3 years and this was the formative years of swami sorry of sri arabindo as a thinker as an as a politician it was at baroda that he learned sanskrit language and other languages of india including his mother tongue bengali till this period he had not known anything about his own mother tongue staying at baroda he learned sanskrit other indian languages and with that he learned indian culture and indian civilization after a period of 13 years at baroda he was invited as a lecturer at national college kolkata where he joined in the year 1906 as a lecturer he delivered speeches to the students class by class on indian philosophy indian religion and hinduism all of a sudden he came in contact with bal gangadhar tilak bal gangadhar tilak told my younger brother why are you wasting your valuable time here at kolkata india is burning yes come 
let us join with us in the freedom struggle and this is how the political way of arabindo was opened by bal gangadhar tilak he became a political activist he began with freedom fighter he struggled hard he went to jails for several times then in the year 1910 when the british government sought to arrest him he escaped to puducherry at that time puducherry was not in india puducherry was a separate kingdom he escaped to puducherry over which the british government had no control so at puducherry which was later known on known as pandicherry so at puducherry he decided he made up his mind to spend his whole life he established an ashram there and the followers of arabindo gave a name to this ashram arabindo sri ashram and in the year 1950 this man attained the mahaprayana i am not using the word die he did not die he just attained mahaprayana this man has written 30 volumes of books so he is an ocean of he has an ocean of writing and i think we should not try our best in one life to sail across this ocean this is why let us delimit ourselves to one of his writings that is each india free a very powerful writing of this man is india free and let me summarize this essay point wise first point of this essay is india free is that happiness lies in harmony you cannot get happiness in isolation for example suppose there is a sad man suppose there is a man who is laden with all sorrows of life and if you advise this man my friend go to an island and stay there you will get peace will that man get peace not definite he will not get peace. so far as you are alone you cannot get peace because peace comes to you in harmony peace comes to you only when you are in connection with your surroundings it may be the surrounding of nature may be the surrounding of human society animal society flowers birds whatever it may be you have a surrounding and you have to develop a rapport with the surrounding only then you will get peace and this is the this is a a uh, philosophical thought which arabindo has given expression to in his essay is india free so this was the first one that mark the this man is approaching to the problem of india from individual stand up point as stand up point he is approaching to his theme individually and later on he is approaching it generally so he says about individual problem that is where happiness comes from and he replies happiness comes from our harmony with the environment he also says second point happiness comes not only from our connection with and our environment but also from our connection with ourselves in us there are three selves there is self of body self of mind and self of spirit you just cannot live as a bodily human being if you claim that i can live on the with the help of my body only no you cannot live inside your body there is the feel of mind inside your body there is the existence of spirit so spirit and mind are closely connected to your body 
your body is closely connected to your spirit and mind so we cannot put them aside so our happiness will come when we make a proper connection between our body our mind and our spirit third point of this essay is india free is that every human being has three levels there is physical level mental level and spiritual level common people ordinary people those people who on from morning to evening just to sustain their survival in the world they are physical level people they never bother their mental level or spiritual level but once you bother about your mental and spiritual level you become a yogi you become a saint you become a great man so arabindo used to tell to the people my friends do not confine yourself to your body only develop your approach to your mind and spirit you see that all the levels physical level mental level and spiritual level grow simultaneously so that you can prove yourself to be a perfect man a complete man in this essay is india free the fourth point is indian civilization here he has given a very broadened picture of ancient india and modern india what had been india in ancient time that why is indian civilization so great indian civilization is great or was great because of its power of harmony it can harmonize with its surrounding as the people of ancient india were expert in harmonizing themselves with their surroundings so was their civilization so indian civilization was great because of its power of harmony and the last point of this essay was india a unique destiny india has or let me use the auxiliary verb had india had a unique destiny here he put a short note on indian history starting with turkis that the turkish people came after the turkish people came the moguls after the moguls came came the great british conquerors so generation after generation outsiders have come have they been able to destroy india completely no they have not been able to destroy rather they have got assimilated with india for power was they are in india that they were not able to destroy this country even though they tried but rather they got themselves assimilated and it was india had a unique power unique power of opening her heart whatever was coming was getting absorbed into india because india had a very broad heart she was incorporating everything into her own heart so by this she was not only broadening her own range she was also giving a particular direction to outside elements in this way india had a unique destiny so these are the points as found in his essay is india free now let us come to the third man of this unit ananda kentis kumara swami uh to be frank enough i had only heard this name i had not known anything about this i will give thanks to all my student friends that it is because of you you that i came to know something about this man kumara swami anand kentis kumara swami was the son of a british woman and a sri lankan man his father was sri lankan and his mother was a british woman this man was a geologist surprising he was a geologist a modern discipline of 
academy. Geology was not found in ancient India. It is found in modern India. So he was a geologist and art scholar. He was a collector, not an administrative collector. He was a collector, a man who used to collect the art ingredients of ancient India. He was a picker, P-I-C-K-E-R. He was a curator. Curator means a custodian, a guardian of museum. And he was a philosopher. As his mother was an English woman, after his birth in Sri Lanka, which was in Indian Empire then, after his birth, there was mental discoordination between his father and mother. So his mother left Kumaraswamy with her husband and she went to went back to England. But later on, the father of Kumaraswamy died. On his death, Kumaraswamy was adopted by her, his mother. He went to England. He stayed in England. He grew there. He lived there. He died there. He was not an Englishman. He was an Indian. He lived there. He sustained himself there. He developed educationally, economically there in England. He died there, but he was an Indian. It was a surprising thing about this man, Kumaraswamy. Uh, anyway, as a geologist, he discovered a mineral and its name was Thorionite. So he could have been a scientist then, but he left the way of geology, which was a profitable business then. Rather, he was very much attracted by the ancient Indian, Indian culture and sculpture. So he became an artist, he became a painter. He painted Indian pictures, Indian mythology, Indian traditional art. And later on, he wrote several books on Indian art and sculpture. His, his most prominent book was Essays in National Indian Nationalism or National Indian Idealism. Essays in National Idealism was his most powerful book. And he has written about the glory of ancient Indian art, that ancient Indian art was in no way inferior to any art in the world. The British critics denigrated Indian, ancient Indian art. They, they, they told that ancient Indian art was grotesque. It was something vague. In Indian art had been created by a very poor imagination. But it was for the first time that Kumaraswamy proved no, ancient Indian art was superior to any other arts in the world, and he proved. And in order to prove the superiority of ancient Indian art, he wrote several books. He set up his own printing machine. He printed those books and he circulated those books among the intellectuals of the world. And it was only after this that the love for ancient Indian art grew among the Western scholars. <coughs> Friends, it is not possible to cover each block in each class. We have touched only up to two units. Other units are left. If time permits, I will help. Otherwise, I am expressing my inability. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. 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 Let me tell Let you one thing. One thing. Uh, do you, do you want... Yes, friends. Yes, friends. Friend, friend, friend. Uh, do you uh, need? Do me you need me to please or do you need me to, you need me to uh, uh, tell you sometimes? Sometimes. Hello, any response? Sir, we are your voice. Sir, 
Yes, yes. Getting equal, getting equal, equal, sir. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, in the okay, in class, the class, I will, I will set it right. Set it right. Uh, do uh, you need, do you need Oriya from Oriya from me? No, sir. No, yes, sir. sir. No, sir. Okay, no, okay. Sir. Then I. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we want to know. Actually, we want to know. Is this the class? Is this the class going on? Again? Again? Yes, yes. The class is going on. Sir, Bhubne, sir. Yes, yes. Class is going on. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Sir, can we can we call the classes? The link. The link. The link. Can we call? Are you a student from R C Bhubne, sir, or not? Yes, sir. We yes, are. Sir, we are from uh, RC, uh, RC and, and I and I and But uh, actually, but, uh, actually, I am finding that it's from Sambalpur. So, no, no, Sambalpur. Uh, the study center has been assigned to uh, means uh, give you the classes. So that is why it is uh, the the study center two one two three four N S C V government college Sambalpur is written. But the sir, classes sir. are given to all the students. Uh, enrolled under RC Bhubaneswar. Okay, sir. okay, sir. So we can go through can the same through the same link. And link and regular. No, uh, links are given. The links are given for uh, yes. uh, every paper. A, a separate link has been given. Yes, so, yes, yes. I know that. I would like, like, like that, sir. We will yes. go through we'll that. Go through that. Time. Yes, yes. That timetable, the same link, and the numbers of the counselors, names, everything, time, everything has yeah, been given. Yeah, Hey, okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, okay, you are sir. welcome. Yes, you are welcome. So 